Let's say that we have a group of 12 rocks or pebbles and we're asked to arrange those 12 into rectangles. We could arrange them into two rows of six, six rows of two, three rows of four, four rows of three, one row of 12, or 12 rows of one. Now let's say we have three rocks and again are asked to put them into rectangles. We can put them into one row or into one column, but that's it. There's no other rectangle that we can create with those three rocks. Maybe it's because there's too few of them. So let's try seven rocks. And again, we're only able to create one row of seven or one column. What number of rocks will allow us to arrange them into only one row or one column? And what number of rocks will allow us to arrange them into multiple different rectangles? Each of these numbers on the left hand side are numbers that if we take this many number of rocks, we will be able to arrange them into rectangles with only one row or one column. Over here on the right, if I take each of these numbers of rocks, I will be able to arrange them into multiple configurations of rectangles. The numbers over here on the left are what we refer to as prime numbers. They are positive whole numbers, so they are natural numbers, and they have exactly two factors, one and itself. We can get them into one row or one column, and we'll have that many rocks in each row. The numbers over here on the right are what we call the composite numbers, and they are numbers, again, positive whole numbers, so they're natural numbers, with more than two factors. We can get them into multiple configurations of rectangles. Now, what about zero and one? Where do we put those numbers? Well, as it turns out, zero is neither prime nor composite, one is also neither prime nor composite. To understand why not, we're going to first delve a little bit deeper into what exactly is a factor. So going back to our rocks, when we had 12 rocks, one and 12 are factors of 12, as are two and six, as are three and four. So think about how many columns, how many rows, a factor is a number that will divide evenly into this value. A factor can also be a variable, it can also be a negative. So negative one times negative 12 are also factors of 12. Multiplied together, they form the product of 12. So let's take the number 10. If we have to list all factors, the easiest way to do this to make sure you don't miss any is to kind of go in order here. So I know that one times 10 will give me a product of 10. So will two times five, three does not divide evenly into 10, nor does four. Five, you can now see that we're back there. So one, two, five, and 10 are the factors of 10 as are negative one times negative 10, negative two times negative five, but we're just gonna list the positive ones for right now. A prime factor is one of these factors that is a prime number. So these are the first few prime numbers, they're gonna continue on, and these are a fascinating set of numbers. You'll notice the only even number that is prime is two. One times two are the only factors of two. Once we get beyond two, for example, four, I can break four into two times two or four times one. There's two different ways we can factor the number four. In here, we also have what's called twin primes. So 11 and 13, where there's only one number between them. 17 and 19 are also twin primes. There's only one number in between them. There's all sorts of interesting facts with prime numbers. But if we take a look at the factors of 10, we can see that the only prime numbers on the list, remember one is not a prime, and we'll come back to that later, are going to be two and five. And we can see that in this list of 12, the only prime numbers we have are two and three. One is not a prime number. Four, we've got one times four or two times two. Six, one times six or two times three. And 12, we've already listed multiple factors for 12. Every number can be written as a product of its prime numbers. So for example, two times two times three, all prime, multiplied to give me 12. And I'll let you in on a little secret here. One actually did used to be considered a prime number hundreds of years ago. The problem is, if one is a prime number, we can now write 12 as the product of one times two times two times three, or one times one times two times two times three, or one times one times one times two times two times three. There's now all of a sudden, if we include one on the prime number list, multiple ways of writing that factor Factorization. If we want to adhere to the mathematician's definition of prime factorization, this is the only unique way of factorizing each number. So in that case, we had to scrap one off the prime number list, no longer considered prime. And if a prime number by definition has exactly two factors, one times itself, we can see that zero is also not going to be prime because I can write zero as a product of zero times one, zero times two, zero times three, zero times four, zero times a hundred, zero times negative of 100, there's clearly more than exactly two factors. Now back to our prime factorization, what are the prime numbers that we can multiply together to get 60? 
One way you can go about this is to use a factor tree. So take a look at 60. What's a number that will divide evenly into 60? And because 60 is even, we can see that 60 will be divisible by 2. So then you can say, okay, 60 divided by 2 leaves us with 30. And I'm going to circle my prime numbers just to make them stand out. And then 30 is a composite number. So we have to keep going. So now we can say, okay, what's a number that will divide evenly into 30? And again, we can see 2 will go evenly. That's prime. And it will leave us with 15. 15 is not prime, so we have to keep going. What are two numbers that could divide evenly into 15? And we can break this into 3, which is prime, times 5, which is also prime. The prime numbers that we can multiply to get 60 are 2 times 2 times 3 times 5. And you can even check this. So we've got 15 times 2 is 30 times 2 is 60. This is the unique prime factorization of 60. Let's try some larger numbers, so 3,300. In the beginning, look for any number that you know will divide evenly. So we know two will divide evenly because it's an even number, but I can also see that 100 is gonna divide evenly. So I'm gonna start there. So let's say we've got 33 times 100, and then can we break either of those numbers down further. So we can see that 33 is the product of three times 11. Now three is a prime number, 11 is also a prime number. I know that 100 can break down into 25 times four. Now 25 can break down into five times five. Five is a prime number. Four can break down into two times two, 2 is also a prime number. The unique prime factorization of 3,300 is 2 times 2 times 3 times 5 times 5 times 11, and we can also write that in exponential notation. I have two 2's and I have two 5's, 1, 3, 1, 11. Let's try 3,375. What's a number that you know is going to divide evenly into that value? Well, because it ends in a 5, we know it will be divisible by 5. So you can always grab your calculator and go 3,375 divided by 5, and you're going to get a value of 675. And also, because that number ends in 5, we know 5 will divide evenly into that number. So again, you can always grab your calculator. 675 divided by 5 will give you 135. So we can also see that that's divisible by 5. It will leave us with 27. I know 27 will break into 3 times 9, 9 will break into 3 times 3. And you're finished when the final number breaks into 2 primes. 3 cubed, which is 27, times 5 cubed, which is 125, multiply to give us that value we started with, 3,375. Okay, could you now factor 1 trillion, 99 billion, 551 million, 473,989? At the end of 2019, a computer was able to produce an algorithm, and this is the largest number to date that's able to be factored into two prime numbers. As you get into larger and larger and larger numbers, as you can see, they become harder to get the prime factorization. But cybersecurity's algorithms depend on how difficult it is to find the prime factorization of those really large numbers. Banking security, internet security, all of those algorithms rely on how hard it is to get those prime factorization for numbers that are really large. The greatest common factor is the largest number that will divide evenly into two or more numbers. So we can see that if we take these two numbers that we just did the prime factorization for, if I asked you what's the largest number that will divide into 3,300 and 3,375, you might struggle initially to get the largest number. But if we take a look at the prime factors, so I've just written them all out here, we can see that they both have one three, they both have one five, and they both have a second five. Those are the only factors that they both have in common. If we multiply those together, 3 times 5 is 15 times 5, the greatest common factor is 75. That's the largest number that will divide evenly into both of those numbers. So if you're ever struggling to get the greatest common factor, quickly you could take each number, break it down into its prime factorization, and then look what are the factors they have in common. Each has a two, each has a three, multiply those together, and the largest number that divides evenly into both of those numbers in this case would be six. The multiples of four begin with four, eight, 12, 16. So we're taking four and we are multiplying it by one, by two, by three, by four. So it's kind of like we're skip counting. So we can list the multiples of 16 and we can list the multiples of 28. And then as we go along the list, the smallest number that they both share is what we call the least or the lowest common multiple. It is the smallest multiple common to each of those numbers. 
112 is the smallest number that will be divisible by 16 and 28. So this is the smallest number where 16 will divide in evenly and where 28 will also divide in evenly. And rather than just continually listing out numbers that can get increasingly larger depending on what we're originally given, we can also go back to the prime factorization. So I know that 16 is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, 28 is the product of 2 times 2 times 7. In order to find the smallest number that both of these will divide evenly into, we can say, okay, they both share a 2, so we need one 2, they both share a 2, we need another 2, we also need a 2, a 2, and a 7. If we multiply all of those together, so 2 to the power of 4 times times 7, we get 112. So again, if we're trying to find the smallest number that all three of these numbers will divide evenly into, we can begin by listing their prime factorization and then take a look at the factors that they have in common. So we can see they all have a 2, so I tried to color coordinate this to make it easier to see. So we know that our smallest number they'll all divide into evenly also will have a factor of 2. These two numbers have a 3, so we're also going to have to have a 3 in there. These two numbers have a 5, we're going to have to have a 5, and then we also have another 2 and another 3. Multiply all of those numbers together, and the smallest number that these three values will evenly divide into is 180. This is the prime factorization of 180, and it's made up of the factors of these three numbers. So if we go back to the beginning now and take a look at 0 and 1, a prime number has exactly two factors, itself and 1. 0 is not prime because we can have 0 times multiple numbers. We're always going to get 0, and so it does not have exactly two factors. We already discussed how 1 used to be a prime number hundreds of years ago. It got taken off the list because if we kept it on the list, we wouldn't be able to take each number and factor it into its prime numbers in a unique way. Composite number has to have more than two factors. 0 is not composite because we cannot write 0 as a product of its prime numbers. One, it cannot be written as more than two factors. The only numbers that we can multiply to get one are one times one or negative one times negative one. We also can't write one as a product of its prime numbers if one is not prime. Zero and one are neither prime nor composite. And back to our rocks, you probably first learned how to count using objects. The final course you can take in high school mathematics is calculus, and calculus simply means a pebble used for counting.